Good morning and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth. And today we have a special guest that uh, I'm very excited to introduce, Kevin DeSanto. Welcome, Kevin. Welcome to Blueprint for Wealth. Thanks, Wayne. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Kevin is a, an investment banker in one of the leading aerospace defense government contracting uh, investment banking firms, Kips DeSanto, which is now part of Capital One. And uh, they uh, recently joined Capital One after a long tenure as being a boutique investment banking firm. And now they're expanding greatly. Uh, we've talked to his partner, Bob Kipps, previously, but Kevin has a unique uh, take on the investment banking world. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we do, let me give you a little background on Kevin. He helps companies assess value and make strategic decisions. He helps quarterback them through the exciting yet cumbersome M&A process, which I do talk about in my new book. And uh, investment banking is a really important part of the exit planning process. And Kevin's going to talk about that. He's also very committed to the community, which we will talk about at uh, the end of the interview in terms of his support of Northern Virginia Family Service, the Community Foundation of Northern Virginia and other entities that he's been involved with throughout his career. Kips DeSanto is an investment bank that's focused on delivering exceptional results for leading growth oriented aerospace, defense, government and technology companies. So, Kevin, as I mentioned, I'm really involved in helping entrepreneurs plan their exits, whether it's a, a sale or a merger and acquisition, or it might be a, a legacy transition. And my, my first question to you today is, when should an entrepreneur consider using an investment banker and when is it not the appropriate fit? Well, Wayne, thanks for having me and for the intro and hopefully uh, I don't contradict anything Bob uh, characterized to you in prior <laughs> discussions partner. here. We have a tendency to do that sometimes. Uh, we're uh, and appreciative of the, the partnership with you on this. I, I, um, I always tell folks that there's never a bad time to quote unquote engage with an investment banker. Um, whether or not it's the right time to actually get started on a formal process and to kind of work to, to put the business in a position where it, it's being considered for an acquisition or a merger is a is a bit of a different story. Um, you know, we like to try to get involved with companies, executives, boards very early in the process. Um, you know, maybe not day one, but certainly within the first few years of kind of starting a business and thinking about how you're going to build value. Ultimately, um, what types of uh, differentiators you're going to build into the business, where you're going to focus your investment time, dollars, um, et, et cetera. And then really trying to understand what the risk profile is of um, the folks that are involved. Are the shareholders risk averse? Is the management team interested in being a part of a growth platform? What types of personalities uh, or personality do you expect the, the organization to have? And by virtue of our kind of experience at the, the tail end of that life cycle and helping people monetize the investment or get rewarded for the risk that they take, we can oftentimes give really helpful anecdotes and perspectives on what you might want to do along the way. And so there really isn't a time that's too early um, and it's not necessarily something that you want to get involved in on a day to day basis of, hey, Kevin, what do you think? Um, mm -hmm. But a couple times a year, once a year, uh, once a quarter, we have a lot of those touch points with companies um, for for, you know, for decades uh, uh, before an actual transaction might happen. And I have, I've found that that's really helpful for two primary reasons. One is it's great to have that perspective as you go so that you're not surprised by the answers that you get when you are kind of finally ready or finally done. Right. And then the second is there's a great relationship that's typically established and there's a lot of trust and there's a lot of comfort in uh, being transparent, being open, being uh, willing to engage in a discussion that has uh, pros and cons or risks and considerations associated with it. And so we found that to be really a, a, just a big part of uh, what we do, what we what has helped us be successful as investment bankers, but also helped a lot of companies be successful as well. Um, we've had two you know, just really good recent examples where uh, we ended up advising companies on their sale transaction in you know transactions that were were exceptional outcomes relative to what they may have expected when they started the business or from the humble beginnings uh, at the start, 
And in both of those cases, um, these were 10, 11, 12 year dialogue uh, that we had with folks. And, um, you know, we one of the clients just said, look, it was amazing to kind of listen and hear and see what you said to us in 2012 and 13 that ended up mm -hmm. coming to fruition in 21 and 22. And not that we can see the future, not that we have every answer, but there are some fundamental aspects of value that don't necessarily align with what an entrepreneur or what a business founder might be thinking about. And yeah. so it's helpful to get that outside perspective and it's helpful for us to learn about the business along the way. And so we're very interested in being a part of that dialogue even before those last six months or nine months when you have the formal process to get through the transaction. Do you usually seek out these companies or do they seek you out and uh, to seek you out for these informal conversations, which it sounds like it's an informal relationship that you're building from the very beginning? Yeah, it is an informal relationship. It allows us to provide very unbiased advice. It allows us to be very objective to folks because our our goal is to work with great companies at the end. And so we really want to help usher that along. Uh, it's how, do you both. See, how do you seek them out? How do you find them? Uh, they find us through uh, <laughs> referrals and connections yeah. and, um, you know, just some of the marketing and branding that, that we do as a team. Um, but we find them as well. We attend a lot of conferences. We are proactively reaching out to companies when you uh, might see a news release or, you know, we, we get uh, kind of word through some of the work that we do that there's other good companies in a sector or within a contract vehicle or in an area. And so we'll be proactive about that. Our, our business is one where there aren't a whole lot of repeat clients uh, because of what we do. And right. so you're generally looking for, you know, those companies that are three, five, six, eight years down the road um, and trying to build that relationship today so that you do have that comfort that I described earlier. Are there any trends that you can identify today that are really hot in the M&A world, at least in the local area that uh, where you're servicing clients? Yeah, two things that I would say. One is um, what is hot today is trying to figure out what risk exists over the next 6, 12, 18 months. But the, okay. all of the talk around recession and sort of what you're seeing in the market with increasing interest rates and maybe a tighter credit market, um, you know, the, the, the concerns around the volatility in the capital markets in general, um, that's really a big topic for folks. What is, what is this going to look like? Is it going to be a big correction? Is it going to be flat? Is it going to continue to be as active as it has been? I'd say that's really kind of the big um, you know, question mark that we're getting. And then the second is uh, really related to growth. And you know, we talk a lot with companies about what, what's really driving value in, in the environment that we're in today. And it's the ability to build a business that has the, the bones, the infrastructure, uh, the ability to grow uh, both on a top line revenue basis and on an earnings or cash flow basis. And that's really where most of the conversations that we have are focused on. Should I be investing organically? Should I be acquiring other companies? Should I be merging with another business? How do we enhance our growth, growth profile? And obviously there's a lot of different answers to that, uh, including adding talent, adding management, incentivizing them the right way. So it's a pretty comprehensive conversation, but the real kind of silver lining, the thread that we're all trying to pull on is, is how to find those high growth businesses that are going to be attractive to private equity investors or to strategic buyers. Are you seeing most uh, buyers in the market being private equity versus strategic, or is it a mix, a fair mix as compared to, you know, the last 10 years or so? Yeah, I'd say if you kind of look at it over a 10 year period of time uh, going back, it was really a, a market that was dominated by strategic buyers. That right. pendulum has shifted over the course of the last 10 years uh, to be much more balanced between private equity and strategic buyers. Uh, maybe even a little bit of a lean towards private equity in terms of deal volume when you incorporate both the platform investment and then all of the add-ons that they are doing. Um, at the end of the day, though, one thing that we've seen is that a lot of those private equity buyers have become very strategic. So they are repeat investors in the space. They have become industry experts over the last decade. And in a lot of the conversations that we have, we don't treat or think about that private equity investor any different than we do a strategic and oftentimes they can be competitive from a value or from a, a kind of a, a multiple vantage point as well so it's been a really interesting um, kind of transition which leads to a little bit of where we think we are today 
because when I mentioned earlier that the private equity pendulum has swung, we have a lot more buyers and investors that are active in the markets that we play in across aerospace defense, government, technology. Um, and so there's a lot more demand for businesses to be invested in or to be acquired as a result of that broader group of folks that have capital that are experienced in the spaces and are trying to actively get deals done. And I always talk about private equity having become institutionalized in a positive way um, where they're really organized around doing transactions and getting things done because you can't build value sitting still. Right. And we think that that's going to be something that we should watch closely here over the course of the next couple of years. If there's a recession or if the markets continue to be volatile, uh, you might not see the, the, the ups and downs that you would have expected to see on the M&A side. It might be a lot more stable um, given there's, there's more demand in today's market. So the demand is there. The demand is there. It hasn't waned based on what we've seen so far. Okay. Um, you know, we're, we're watching closely. Again, there's, if anybody has figured out or has the crystal ball on where this is going to go, I'd love to be a part of that. Um, it, just all be retired. It, it just feels like there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, of moving parts and, um, you know, it just feels like there's a pretty steady focus on um, acquiring businesses and, using that as a, a part of uh, the tool set as a board of directors or as shareholders of a business. Do you often um, advise directors as opposed to, you know, the officers of the company? Do you serve as a, an advisory uh, uh, resource for boards of directors uh, as opposed to just the, you know, the CEO? I know a lot of these companies are, the CEO is the board of directors, but right. uh, in many cases uh, they, they may have, expanded their range of influence to include other independent, you know, thought leaders and, you know, trying to help them grow the, the business. Do you often uh, serve as an advisory uh, role to the board of directors as well? From a, a technical vantage point, our typical role is to be hired as the financial advisor for the company. Right. And by virtue of that, you end up having, a, um, a group of stakeholders that you're working with, and it involves the management team, it involves the shareholders, it involves the board of directors, it might in some cases uh, involve a board of advisors. And then we obviously have to partner with folks like you on the legal side and with their wealth management team as they plan for transaction structure or post deal activity. And so we end up being a, a part of that discussion with all of those stakeholders when we are advising a company. Um, you know, again, technically we're, we're working to get the, the company through a transaction, but there's obviously a lot of folks that are involved in that from those various positions. And, um, you know, every company is different. Everyone is unique. Sometimes uh, we have a private equity investor that's a key part of that decision making process. Sometimes you have a control shareholder. Uh, that right. has more say than others do. Sometimes you have a, we do a lot of divestiture work for large corporations. Sometimes, you know, you'll have different constituencies or stakeholders within an organization like that, that are really making that decision. And sometimes it's financially motivated. Sometimes it's strategic. Sometimes it's about legacy or, you know, sort of what the future is going to hold for employees or for um, customers. There's the objectives and the priorities are all very different every time we enter into a transaction process. And so we have to work hard as advisors to make sure we're not just kind of throwing a cookie cutter. Hey, here's how you get from A to Z. Uh, it really has to be what do you want to accomplish? Why do you want to accomplish that? And how do you want to accomplish that? And then we work to facilitate the best outcome we can based on what those kind of priorities are, what those objectives are that our client lays out for us and, and who those stakeholders are. In terms of the trends that you're experiencing in the government contracting sector, are there any subsectors uh, that are really getting a lot of attention? I, you know, I, I constantly am thinking about you know, penetration testing and cybersecurity and things like that. I, I know it's a really hot area. Um, what are you seeing in, in terms of your uh, your experience in terms of the deal flow and, and what's really doing well as compared to what's not? People looking forward 5, 10, 15 years trying to understand how to build businesses that are going to have relevancy, staying power uh, through a lot of massive shifts in what's occurring today, whether it's the evolution of technology or 
you know, sort of what the mission opportunities are, whether it's a, you know, a, a commercial company trying to bring a, a software as a service model to, you know, the utility sector, or it is a government contractor trying to help NASA or the IRS uh, evolve their mission, it, it tends to really be about the future of technology. Um, what type of platforms are folks going to be using downstream? What are the, um, what are the, the support requirements that are going to exist in, in that environment? And, you know, whether it's a, a commercial off the shelf technology that already exists today, or yeah. it's going to be something that's going to be developed on a one off, um, you know, sort of narrow focus because of the unique needs of the mission. Um, what we're seeing is, I'd say two things. One, in order to try to be there downstream, folks are looking to big ideas. And I'd say space is the one that really comes back and has um, just a, a ton of action uh, for a ton of companies and sort of thinking about what the future might hold. That is a big new frontier and there's a lot of competitive dynamics uh, across the geopolitical environment to be ahead. There's a lot of concern about the types of um, challenges that exist there and what do, whether we're gonna be ready to handle them, what the right technology platforms are. I mean, that's just a massive new world that um, lots of companies are focused on um, in our ecosystem. That's the other exciting. is data <clears throat> and yeah. it, you know, uh, it, it, it's connected to space. It's connected to almost everything that we're doing um, it's really data is the story and, you know, how we're sharing it, how we're accessing it, how we're using it, how we're making sense of it. Um, it, it it's almost every customer's mission to figure out how to do more or to be better with the data that they're accumulating right now. And almost every infrastructure we see is not ready for it. Almost every customer is already behind the curve in terms of being able to use what they have. And so it seems like it's a really, really neat time for folks to be continuing to evolve their capability and knowledge and um, you know core core competencies around what to do with data in its you know zillions of various forms that exist out there. Um, I, I could go on. Uh, I've got tons of questions <laughs> just percolating in my mind, and especially on the data side, um, you know, with artificial intelligence and machine learning and all that's going on in that world today, but. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and go into the to the community service aspect of of Kevin DeSanto because um, you know I I've been following your career and watching you uh, get involved in in different organizations. What inspires you to get involved in organizations like Northern Virginia Family Service and and the Community Foundation of Northern Virginia? How how did you get involved with those organizations and and, and why do you do it? Um, the, the why for me is um, just a, a fundamental view of how lucky and fortunate I've been and just wanting to do anything that I can to be a part of the community in a way that's different than going to work every day or you know being at home with my family. And so I just look at it as a, a great opportunity to get involved, to learn, to understand what's happening in ways that I can't see or experience, um, you know, in an office or, you know, with with, uh, with the various different things that I might be doing outside the office. And so I, I just, I, I think it's a great way to learn. It's a great way to gain exposure. It's a great way to maintain perspective. It's a great way to um, hopefully have an impact and, and allow organizations to leverage some of my skills or, you know, our uh, giving to be in a position to, to just get better, to, to do more. Um, and so it's a pretty fundamental part of just who I am. I just feel very fortunate and lucky. And, um, you know, I want to take time and give back and, and to do um, as much as I can to help organizations that are, that are doing important things in our community. Tell um, us a little bit about your, uh, uh, your involvement with Northern Virginia Family Service. I mean, I'm on the board, you're on the board. Um, what is it about that organization that is so uh, excellent? Because I find that it's it's such an excellently run organization and they do so many good things for the community. What is it that uh, inspires you to uh, serve on the board there? It, it ties back to your first kind of question on this topic of, you know, why are you involved and how did you get involved? Um, a big part of what I've looked for is great leadership 
and the ability to to be around great leaders, um, whether it's on the board or it's in the executive leadership team. And, um, you know, as I've gotten introduced to different organizations that I've supported over the years, I, I've really been drawn to folks that have a core focus on the community, that have a very thoughtful mission. Um, and um, I've always I've always tried to describe this in a thoughtful way, but one that is not related to, um, you know, just primarily one specific topic, right? We've all had experiences with different illnesses or different challenges. And the ones that I've really been uh, drawn to are the ones that have an impact on the community broadly. And I think that's where the MBFS really comes in and, and just does such an amazing job for so many different parts of the community through grant programs and government funding and fundraising and being able to help um, families, being able to help uh, women, dealing with things like mental health, um, really just having a, a broad impact on the community through all of the different challenges and issues that exist and doing it in a way that's that's grounded. Um, you know, I, I think their involvement in the Head Start program to me is, is very unique and uh, just hits home, right? Having, you know, younger kids and and seeing the challenges that exist in, in even the best of circumstances uh, for kids, especially over the last three or four years, and knowing that we're supporting one of the, the, the greatest programs and getting folks um, started early down a path of education and connectivity into the community. I mean, that just, that, that's it, right? That seems like that's a recipe for success and a chance to get um, a community to a better place downstream by getting to the, the, the children early, getting them involved in formal education and getting them organized in a way that ultimately I think is going to lead to success downstream. And so that Head Start program in particular is one that really resonates with me. Yeah, I like that. I like uh, the serve campus out in Prince William County that you know serves disenfranchised you know individuals, people who don't have a place to stay, people who don't have food. I mean, they do so much. Northern Virginia Family Services uh, is really a unique organization in this whole area, and they do it so well, led by Stephanie Berkowitz. And, and Kevin, as the treasurer of the organization, um, I'm really uh, fortunate to be involved with it myself. So um, thank you for your service on that, uh, as well. on that organization. And we, we uh, are grateful to have you involved. I'm, I'm grateful to be involved with it too. Um, we've been talking with Kevin DeSanto, who is an investment banker. He's the co-founder of Kips DeSanto, which is part of Capital One. Um, last, last question. If you had to give an entrepreneur advice about starting his business today in the sector that you're involved in, what would be the, the, the recipe for success that you would uh, lay out for him or her in doing that? Uh, my uh, 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 simple version of that story, which is a long conversation, is prepare to get lucky. And I just think that there is an element of hard work and effort that goes into this. And then, you know, the success that we have is oftentimes not something that was a direct line from that preparation or from that build or from the time and energy and effort along the way. Um, and it, it, but it just happens to, to folks that, to build that, that are organized, that are really committed to what they're doing. And you just keep on that path. And uh, what we've seen is just, Folks that really build in that way, they get lucky and good things happen when you're there. Is it luck? I, Is it really I, luck? I think that that's the hard part about this, right? It, it's not luck uh, in its truest sense, but it's ultimately yeah. one or two things along the way that are going to define your success at the end of this. And rarely are they in the business plan. Rarely are they in the reason or the rationale for starting the business. And rarely are they things that you probably should have won or should have been successful at along the way uh, because you weren't ready or you were going up against greater competition or whatever the case might be. But willing to take those chances, huge factor. You took so a deep. chance to start the business. You take a chance along the way at things that don't necessarily fit. And good things tend to happen to people who are willing to take those risks. That's the definition of an entrepreneur. 
That's the it definition. Like it, but you know this, sometimes entrepreneurs can kind of grow a, a, averse to risk along the way or can you know, sort of think about things in a way that is a little too linear or a little too straight once you've gotten to a certain point. And it's keeping that entrepreneurial spirit that I think ends up allowing people to get lucky, uh, as you say, not really, but I, I always joke that that's, uh, it's a little bit of when we don't expect it that ends up being the most instrumental in our success along the way. So prepare to get lucky and keep up the entre entrepreneurial spirit all the way to the yeah, end. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Kevin. It's been great having you as a guest on Blueprint for Wealth. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Wayne. I appreciate being here. And uh, stay tuned for an educational moment. We're going to talk about what it takes to get ready to sell your business. So it's very linked up with what Kevin does for a living. And if you need to talk to Kevin, you know where to find him at kipstosanto.com, right? That's right. All right. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Hi, this is Wayne Zell and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth's educational moment. We're going to be talking today about selling your business. And this is part one of a multi-part series that will help you get your business ready for sale. So let's get started. The overview is that we're trying to do some corporate house cleaning. We want to do some due diligence on ourselves before we unleash a prospective buyer on our books and records. So the first thing we're going to do is look at our minutes to authorize prior acts as well as future uh, acts that need to be approved by the board of directors or shareholders. We're going to make sure that we've filed with all the appropriate jurisdictions and states. We're going to examine our financial statements and we're going to dig into that a little bit. And then we're going to talk about legal compliance and due diligence in a little greater detail. When I say we need to update our minutes or our consents, if you're a corporation, you must have formal approvals by your board of directors and your shareholders of certain acts that need to be approved on an annual basis or from time to time. So when we mention that we need to ratify prior acts, that means we're approving things that we did in the past, and that would include electing our officers and directors. Approving leases that we entered into for long-term leases, capital or operating leases. Loans that we may have borrowed money or lent money to third parties. Approving of any benefit plans that we may have adopted for the benefit of our employees, including 401k plans, profit sharing plans, qualified retirement plans, and health benefit plans, medical plans, dental plans, all of those things need to be approved at least by the board of directors, depending on what your bylaws say. And lastly, we want to make sure that any stock that has been issued to shareholders, including the founders, has been approved and any stock options and the plans approving of the issuance of those options have been approved by the board of directors and shareholders uh, if required. When we're talking about approving new transactions, you're about ready to discuss the sale of your business. And so you may receive an indication of interest. You may receive a letter of intent. When you narrow down the letters of intent to one and you want to sign it and to the exclusion of all others, your board of directors should approve it and should send it for approval to the shareholders. When you have negotiated the definitive agreement, the purchase agreement, with the prospective buyer. We want the board and the shareholders to sign off on those documents as well. So we're going to have a consent of the directors and shareholders or a meeting where it's duly called in accordance with your bylaws and approved at the meeting. And so minutes need to be taken and included with your corporate records. And last but not least, I didn't include it on the slide, you need to have a stock book with all of the stock certificates at least copied front and back and signed and a stock ledger that indicates what stock certificates were issued to whom and when they were canceled and reissued. Part of the due diligence process, part of your corporate house cleaning is going to, making, to make sure that you have all of your organizational documents in order and that you filed with the state and local jurisdictions that you're required to file with. 
your articles of incorporation or your certificate of incorporation were filed at the time the entity was formed. And if you amended them, you want to make sure you have copies of the actual filed versions, not what you sent to the state, but what you received back, including a certificate from the state indicating that you were filed as a corporation or a limited liability company, depending on how you're structured. Any amendments that were filed with the state, you want to make sure it's in your corporate books and records. If you're a corporation, you need to have bylaws, which is the contract between the shareholders, the directors, the officers, and the corporation on how the corporation is run. If you're a limited liability company, an LLC, you'll have an operating agreement. And if you're a corporation with two or more shareholders, you may need a shareholders agreement as well. The buyer is going to want to make sure that the business that they're buying is in good standing, meaning that they are properly formed, but also in compliance with current law by filing annual reports and paying any fees that you have to pay to the state, including franchise taxes, which are payable in states like Delaware and Virginia. If you were formed in Delaware and you're operating in another state like Maryland or Virginia or Florida, you need to make sure that you have registered as a foreign entity in the states in which you're operating. It's a little more complicated than just saying, well, I have an employee there. But if you have an employee there, an office there, you're selling from that location or you're keeping inventory at that location or you're, you've got uh, property located at that location, you're going to want to make sure that you are filing properly in all of those jurisdictions. It's not just sales tax or use tax or payroll tax or even income tax. You actually have to file as a foreign entity. And lastly, if you are an S corporation or treated as one, because remember an LLC can elect to be treated as an S corp, you want to make sure you have the official letter that was issued to you from the Internal Revenue Service when you were granted S corp status. The buyer always looks for that. With regard to your financial statements, most of our clients who sell their businesses are doing their accounting on the cash basis of accounting meaning that they file their tax returns on a cash basis and they don't accrue accounts receivable on their books and records or accounts payable or other accruals that you would normally reflect an economic revenue number or an economic expense number. They're only doing cash basis. The buyer is going to want you to make representations and warranties in your agreement that your books are prepared in accordance with GAAP generally accepted accounting principles, which requires accrual basis accounting. So you may need to restate your financial statements. It's not a big deal to do that, believe me, unless you've got significant amounts of inventory and then it becomes a little bit more complicated. But have your accountant come in and prepare gap-based financials to match and reconcile to the cash basis financials. These financial statements will account for liabilities of all kinds, including ones that may not be officially recognized on your balance sheet, but may be disclosed in footnotes to the financial statements. The footnotes, which are also in accordance with GAAP, reveal the method of accounting that you're using, how you're recognizing revenue and accruing expenses, how you're depreciating your assets, how you're maintaining your leases and accounting for them, and, and how you're accounting for your equity in the company, including stock options, phantom stock, and other deferred compensation arrangements. The last point on financial statements is whether or not you are going to show the buyer that you've had some diligence done by an outside third party on your financials. The difference is significant. If you just hand your financial statements over, your QuickBooks or whatever you're using over to your accountant at the end of the year and have them prepare financial statements, that's known as a compilation form of engagement, which is the least rigorous, the lowest cost, but also it doesn't give the buyer any assurance of the validity or accuracy of your financials. If you have a review done by your accounting firm, 
they may perform some analytical procedures to make sure that there's nothing truly unusual about the numbers that you're giving them to report in the financial statements. But if you do an audit, then you're getting an assurance from the auditors that your financial statements are prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles with no exceptions, hopefully, and that gives you an unqualified opinion and that's what buyers are really looking for if you can afford it and you have the time to do it. Last but not least is legal compliance and due diligence. This is where you get your attorneys involved. And if your attorney is a specialist like a government contracts lawyer, or you've only used your lawyer uh, for technology purposes to register trademarks or patents, you are going to need other lawyers involved to help you do your due diligence and do your corporate cleanup to get you ready so that the buyer comes in and looks at everything and says, wow, these people really have it together. The first thing they're gonna do is make sure that your equity ownership is properly reflected in your books and records, and that means stock certificates are issued, they're recorded, and that you have subscription agreements for the stock. It also will include approvals of stock option plans and any issuances of stock or stock options under the plan. It will have a clear understanding, the lawyers will have a clear understanding and you will have records relating to all of your borrowing that's currently outstanding, including COVID-19 type relief that was provided by the federal government, such as payroll protection plan loans. You're going to want to make sure that somebody, either internally or externally, catalogs all of your active contracts. And then make sure that if you do have contracts with customers or vendors, are they assignable in a sale of the business? Even if you sell your stock, can you do so without requiring the consent of your contracting party? Taxes are another very difficult and complicated area of legal compliance and due diligence. You're going to want to make sure you've paid and filed all your sales tax, payroll tax, income tax, and any other tax that is owed by the company to the taxing authorities. You're going to want to have good records of all of the returns that you've filed with the IRS or the state or wherever you reside. You're going to want to make sure you have copies of all the returns and you're going to want to have evidence of the actual filing. If you have that in your files, it'll make life a lot easier for you and the buyer when they come around. Your employees are another critical area. Do you have I-9s for every employee? In other words, did you check their immigration status or their citizenship status when they were employed? If not, You'd better get it in the records now for every single employee. Do you have non-competes, non-disclosure agreements, and non-interference agreements with your employees? You, at a minimum, are going to need non-disclosure agreements. And then have you accounted for and reported properly for all of the employee benefits that you're providing to your employees? Are you treating independent contractors properly? Are they truly independent contractors? Have you handled the situation where a, an employee is listed as being exempt from overtime? And have you actually verified their status to make sure that they truly are exempt versus non-exempt where they would be required to be paid overtime? Do you have any litigation pending against you or any threats of litigation or claims? Any governmental investigations? Any IRS audits? You need to disclose all of that to the buyer, so you might as well get all that inf information together. When it comes to intellectual property, privacy laws now, and data protection, the buyer is going to want to make sure you have valid licenses to everything that you're using in your business that would constitute intellectual property, such as software, software licenses, trademarks, patents, copyrights, trade secrets, and know-how. If you own real estate in your company, 
you're going to need to have detailed information regarding the real estate, whether or not it's subject to current zoning regulation, and whether or not there are any environmental violations. And if you're leasing the real estate, you still are going to have to give reps and warranties regarding environmental issues, particularly depending on the type of business that you operate. And lastly, but not least, you wanna make sure that you've got your customers and your vendors documented well. You wanna know who your pipeline of prospective customers and contracts are, and you wanna make sure that you've got a complete list of all of these people available to you so that at the appropriate time, after you've got a signed letter of intent and after you've negotiated the critical terms in your purchase agreement, you can turn over this very secret information to a prospective buyer, or you may wanna wait until after you've signed the definitive agreement and give them a chance to do due diligence on your customers particularly. So that's what I've got for you in part one of selling your business. You're listening and watching Blueprint for Wealth, and thanks for tuning in. Tune in next time for another special topic and special guest on Blueprint for Wealth. I'm Wayne Zell. Have a great week. Thank you.